So first of all, welcome to the second of the superintendent forums this year. The first one was held, I believe it was in early December at West Middle School. Uh, this is obviously at East Middle School and I'll have to tell those of you that come from this area that this was a school I taught at for probably about 10 years. So I enjoyed my time here. I was a special education teacher, taught in a substantially separate classroom. I was very involved in student activities and every time I walk in this building, and that was back in the 80s by the way, but every time I walk in this building it always feels at home. I will finish up with uh, a superintendent forum uh, I believe coming up in the spring uh, at South Middle School and also at North Middle School. So we will have an opportunity to be out there at least four times during the year. The format is very simple. I will do an opener and really just talk about some things happening in the Brockton Public Schools. I will then open it up for your questions and hopefully I have answers. Uh, there have been a number of you that I've been able to follow up with some of the concerns or questions that you've had. So let me start by talking uh, about the Brockton Public Schools. Uh, many of you know I've been in the district for 41 years. You just heard me talk about my time for many years as a teacher at the elementary level, at the middle school level. Um, I've been a school adjustment counselor in the district. I've worked in a number of administrative jobs and very proudly became superintendent in 2013. Uh, during that time, we've had a lot of positive things happening in our district. I'm always so proud of the achievement of our students. We are on a national level as far as having had a level one high school, level one and level two middle schools, and a level one elementary school. What we do find is if our students stay with us from the time they enter kindergarten or for a length of time through their elementary years into middle school and high school, they stand to do very well. Our students get accepted to some of the most prestigious colleges around. Our students, and if you look at the makeup of Brockton High, we have a very diverse community. Many of our students come here as young children not speaking the English language. It doesn't take them very long to learn the language, to catch up. And when you look at the makeup at the high school, when we have John and Abigail Adams scholarship winners that have done extremely well on the MCAS test, or those students that are part of our National Honor Society. It looks like the makeup of our students. It ranges from students, again, that came here not speaking English, to those students that have been from English-speaking homes. So we're very proud of the achievement of our students. We also offer many, many services. Not only a very strong bilingual department, a number of you are here this evening. I know supporting and doing some translating you know, for our parents. We have a, a large uh, special education department and we offer your students every opportunity in order for those students to succeed. We have after school programs, we have grant writing that happens in the district. Everything that we can do to support your child from the time that they enter, if they enter at preschool, all the way until they graduate in 12th grade. We're also proud during the past couple of years, we have had extreme budget cuts. And I probably don't need to tell anybody here that last year it hit an all-time high of a $16 million deficit that we had to close in the Brockton Public Schools. And granted, our funding is very complicated. It comes a large part from our state, and that is based on what they call a foundation formula, where they look at the poverty rate. They look at a lot of factors where they decide the state as to how much money for our students in the Brockton Public Schools. Our city, so the, the difference is our state provides about 80% of the funding for our schools. Our city is mandated to then make up that other 20% to reach what they call foundation or 100%. So while I don't have issue that our city has tried very hard to meet that and has no choice, or you'll be penalized if you don't meet that 20% with the 80% coming in from the state. We also have additional grant funding that comes in, Title I funding that, that comes in from the federal government based on a poverty rate in our large urban district. But we are a city that is at a turning point. And the one thing that is very clear is we cannot run a school district just on a foundation formula from the state, a match of 20% from the city, 
without going above and beyond that. And I want to make it very clear when people are out there saying, well, the city met their foundation. Well, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for the students in Easton because that town, when they meet their foundation, they go above and beyond it by many percents to support their students if they need technology, if they need one-to-one -one devices, if they need new curriculum, if they need additional supports for their students. So in the city of Brockton and many urban districts, we struggle. We're not necessarily a wealthy community. We're a hard-working community. But in order to do that, we as a community have to decide what is important for the future of our children. I live here with you. I've lived here for 35 years. My children have attended and graduated from the Brockton Public Schools. And the one thing that I will tell you is the most important thing that I have is my home. I've worked for it along with my husband my whole life. And the reason I say that is those of you here that own property, that are invested in our city, I'm sure will agree with me that in order to keep your property at a strong value, the most important thing that we can do, and while it's important to have public safety, and of course it is, every one of us would say that, or while it's important to have the fire truck respond when there's a fire, those are very important things that I fully support. But the number one thing for me and my family was the education of my children because their future depended on what we did here in the Brockton Public Schools. So you will hear me talking this spring. We've been talking about what's called an equity in education, our lawsuit. And what's, what that means is many years ago, those of you know the history of Brockton well before we had a foundation formula to support education. And our students were sitting in classes of 40 kids up at Brockton High in a class. They didn't have the textbooks that they needed at the time. And we as a city filed, along with other cities, an equity in education lawsuit that brought about the foundation formula that I just talked to you about, which has benefited Brockton for many years, getting a support from the state so that we level the playing field. But the time has come where we need to push the state on a broken foundation formula that is no longer supporting our students the way they need to be supported. And at the same time, we need to push our city to make sure that we are going above and beyond foundation, that we are making good decisions for every one of our children, no matter what their needs are, no matter if they come in having to learn the English language. These are the people that are gonna be running our city many years from now. They're the people as we get older that are going to support us with an economy with jobs, that are gonna buy houses and live here. It's important that every one of our children, no matter how they come to us, have the same opportunities that you would have in a West Bridgewater, that you would have in any one of these surrounding communities. As I sit here, I just noticed our representative, Michelle Dubois, walked in. And Hi, while, everybody. sorry, Michelle. And, and while I'm talking about that, and I also have seen some school committee members. I see uh, Judy Sullivan right here from your Ward 5, very, very active in the school committee. I know I saw Tim Sullivan at one point. I see Tim, you're behind the camera. Tim Sullivan, uh, Ward 7, um, and I will get back to talking about the support from the state and the school committee, but I want you to know that your school committee puts in hours upon hours. They put in time at regular school committee meetings, which I know are on cable. I would advise you to listen to <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the discussions that go on every two weeks in a school committee meeting. <clears throat> they continue to support your district, everything from safety uh, and transportation subcommittees, budget and finance subcommittee meetings, policy subcommittee meetings, committee meetings to talk about extracurricular for our students. They do all of the bargaining for seven unions. Your school committee is very active. I have them involved in retreats where we get together on Saturdays, yes, Saturdays, to start to talk about issues that we need additional time to discuss as far as how we can continue to support the district. And I called out Michelle when she walked in because, Michelle, I want you to know that no matter the struggle representative, the one thing I know for sure is with Representative Cronin, Representative Dubois, Representative Cassidy, there's not a time that I can't go into the State House make sure that we are advocating and we have the support of our legislative group. 
Last night at the school committee meeting, I talked about an additional $250,000 that was cut out of the budget by the governor back around uh, July and August and was put back in the budget. Uh, Senator Brady supported it in the Senate. Your legislative group supported it when it got to the House. And it ended up not only staying somehow in the budget, thank goodness, because every little bit of that money supports what is happening right now in our schools. So I want to thank you for the continued advocacy, every one of you, your elected officials, that work very hard for our children, and we're very fortunate to have all of you. So looking at the challenges that we face ahead, when I talk about an equity in education lawsuit, we're getting very close to hosting uh, an event with urban districts from throughout the state to start to talk about it's not as easy as just filing a lawsuit. There has to be a plaintiff, a lead plaintiff, which would be one of our students. We've already started to have discussions with our parents about the naming of that student and also to put together a legally defensible case that talks about the haves and the have-nots. And we don't want our students being part of the have-nots. And what I'm going to directly relate that to is starting one year from now, your sophomores at Brockton High School, that is the year that they take their MCAS test. So 10th grade is critical for them to pass their MCAS test in English, uh, language arts, math, and also a science. And that allows them to get their high school diploma. One year from now, the students will no longer be taking a paper and pencil test. It is a new test called MCAS 2.0, and it is an online test. And what is important about that, when I talk about the haves and the have-nots, is when you talk about some communities, there are children as little as, and, and some of your homes may also have this, three and four-year-olds that actually have their own devices. You walk in a home and there might be two and three devices in the home for students to do their work, for students to to use in so many different ways with this, you know, certainly the 21st century technology that has really taken over our world at this point. And unfortunately in our schools, although we are making some inroads, we do not have one-to-one -one devices for those students. And as I stand here as your superintendent, one of my priorities is to make sure that every student has a one-to-one -one device from the time they come in as a kindergartner all the way through until they leave us in 12th grade. Not only to be prepared for that high stakes testing, but also to be prepared for college and beyond career, et cetera, for what they need. So when you hear us start to talk about an equity and education lawsuit, I find that one of the great equalizers. And when you heard me talk about other towns that look at their budget and make decisions to go above and beyond that foundation amount of money that they're using to support education, so they can purchase those type of one-to-one -one devices, purchase that type of curriculum to support that instruction. And that is what we need. When you hear me talk about back 25 years ago and Brockton High having classes of 40 students, unfortunately, as we struggled in this budget and a $16 million deficit is something we've never faced in the Brockton Public Schools before. And that hit us where it hurt. It hit us with teachers. It hit us with paraprofessionals. It hit us with monitor teacher assistants. It hit us with other support staff that we had to cut just to be able to open those doors in September. So we're, we're once again very dependent on state funding when you heard me talk about the formula. So as we go into this next budget, if you look at the surrounding towns, many of the times you'll hear them already, how many know many of them have already passed their budgets for the year? So there, the superintendents in other towns are going before their town councils, and they're talking about, I need um, a new position because we have a larger than not kindergarten class coming in. I need a new special education position. They're already out there looking at what their budgets are for next year. They're making decisions about hiring teachers. And in places like Brockton, we are awaiting the end of the month when the governor comes out with his budget from the state, because we're very dependent on that, we're looking at inflation factors, we're trying to figure out if we are going to be able to meet our budget next year, or are we continuing to cut in our budget? And that basically is unacceptable when you're trying to run a school district. So those are the challenges that we face. On a very positive note, I couldn't be more proud to be your superintendent. 
Today I was up at the high school and the principal said to me, are you coming to the basketball game? I try to get to at least one game for every sport, girls and boys, to see what's happening. I try to get to all of the plays. I try to get to the musicals, you know, to the um, pops concerts, all of the wonderful things that when we talk about, and you just heard me talk about other towns, I doubt they can compare to what happens here in the Brockton Public Schools for the way that we continue to support our youngsters in extracurricular activities. And the principal said to me, we have um, an undefeated basketball team right now. So Friday night, I believe they're playing uh, Bridgewater Raynham. It's a wonderful thing to go and watch our boys up at the staff gymnasium if you get a chance to come out and see. And like I said, we offer so many sports. We have tried to make sure that even with the budget cuts, we provide opportunities, especially at high school, where students are building a portfolio as they apply to colleges. Unfortunately, it has hit our middle schools. We have had to cut some of the sports and extracurricula. And every time we have an extra dollar, you will hear the school committee members looking to bring back some opportunity for our middle school students. That is hurt. We also rely on a lot of grants. And as I look at the direction of the country, and I keep hearing about stocks going up and the um, unemployment rate you know, going uh, down, so the economy is picking up a little, my hope is that we are going to see a turn in grants. Because I will tell you, having been a grant writer and overseeing a large grant department in the district, there was a time back in the uh, mid-90s where we didn't know what to do. We had so much grant money. We had grant money for every school for after school programs. We had Saturday programs going on where families were taking trips into museums. We had programs happening on the weekends at night and were really able to support academically many of the needs of our students, able to purchase things, summer programs for over two and 3,000 kids. We have watched these grants dry up year after year after year and we continue to try to provide grant opportunities every way that we possibly can. So we stay on top of that. I also will tell you, if you have an opportunity, and we are going to be putting out advocacy uh, statements with parents to get support. Presently, starting back in 1965, and we did a presentation last night at the school committee, we have had something called Title I funding. At the time when it came in, in um, 1965, it was based on children that were living in poverty. They were the only students that received additional support with Title I. It could be bringing them into a small group and being supported with reading. Same thing for math. When 1978 came on board, because we were a district that reached 40% poverty rate throughout, and that was based on free and reduced lunch for our children, we were able to provide Title I services to any child in our schools. It didn't matter if they were a child that came from a family living in poverty. It was for any child that needed this kind of support. Over the years, we rely on that funding to the tune of close to $6 million comes into our district for support in our schools for Title I. And I am being told a year ago that when you had a change of administration at, uh, in Washington, D.C., a new Secretary of Education came in at a federal level that there was money under Title I that was being uh, thought to be cut, to be reduced. And that is not something that we, as a district, we have watched every year that funding increased. Every year that has increased. So that is something that we're watching very closely, and that would be a letter to Senator Warren, uh, Senator uh, Markey, and you also have our representative, Stephen Lynch. So we will be doing and putting together templates and letters for parents to support to make sure that that funding remains in our school to support our teachers for professional development and also for supporting our students academically. Um, I, again, I, I, want to, I want to leave before I open it up uh, to uh, questions. I do want to talk about a couple of things that I think are uh, important and some of them are hot button issues. Some of you might be here this evening to talk about that. One is we have changed the kindergarten date. We are one of the only districts in the state, I believe there were three left out of 358 districts that had a December 31st cutoff date for kindergarten. So we were finding that for the months of September, October, November, and December, and we called them Burr babies because of 
the months, September, November, uh, October, November, December, Burr babies. That we were struggling with many of those students. They were coming in very young, and not only was it when they came in at kindergarten at four years old, and don't forget, when my children went to kindergarten, although we had a December 31st cutoff date, it was a half-day program. So little four-year-olds were sitting there for half a day, not being required to sit for full day. The research has shown that we need to get the children into school full-time for full-day kindergarten, beginning when they are of kindergarten age. But in looking at that, the curriculum is also very competitive for these children. The expectations of what those of you that have had kids in preschool or maybe teach preschool know the expectations for a little preschooler. Usually it's a half a day. Usually it's learning routines and learning songs and learning how to play in a group. By the time your child is coming to kindergarten, our expectations and the expectations at a state level are that there is letter recognition, many times number recognition, and many times these students are working with letters and numbers in their reading. What also happens when you hear me talk about a Burr baby at four years old coming into a full day program, don't forget when they then go to middle school as a sixth grader, because our middle school is sixth, seventh, and eighth, many times they're 10 years old. And more importantly, when they enter Brockton High School with 4,200 students up at our high school for grades nine through 12, many of them, instead of coming in at 14 years old before they enter, which is the typical age for all of your other towns that surround us, many times they're 13 and will not turn 14, some of them, until December. So our reasoning was very research-based. What we did was made two moves so we could work with families. The cutoff for this year is November 1st. Your child has to be five by November 1st. Next year, September of 2019, so September 2018, it is November 1st. They have to be five. September of 2019, we will roll it back to September 1st, like all of our surrounding districts in the, pretty much in the Commonwealth. So I know there's been concern. I want to tell those parents that we are working for those youngsters that will miss kindergarten this year. We figure that there's about 200. Usually there's about 100 a month that make up our class for the year. So we are looking to have preschool um, spots for those youngsters. So that very much is something that we're working on. I also want to let the parents know that I'm very pleased that we have had a group working in the district of teachers, um, a number of our union members, our school committee, and our administration on what we call a district capacity project. And it is starting to look at some of those issues that are very new that we're dealing with in the schools, and you're probably dealing with if you have teenagers in some of your homes. And if you don't have teenagers yet, I'm sure you're going to know that it's coming. We're dealing with social media that is coming into the schools and wreaking havoc with things that are going on outside of school, and yet it becomes an issue that we're dealing with in the schools. We're dealing with um, code of conduct issues such as dress codes that we're looking at maybe a little differently that we looked at a number of years ago. We're looking at the so-called bullying. And when we talk about the social media and the cyber bullying, you know, it used to be if somebody picked on you at school and it's not that we don't deal with those things, we deal with them every day. You could kind of escape it, you could go home, you could kind of hang around with the neighborhood. There's no escaping cyber media anymore. So these are things that we want to have discussions with our community looking at our code of discipline how we discipline students in school, how we look at a dress code, how we look at social media, how we look at bullying. So next Wednesday night, actually a week from tonight, from 6 to 7.30 at Brockton High School, but this is for the whole district. It is called a parent forum. And this is going to be a forum that is actually presented by parents. So we have trained parents, along with some of our administrators, to work together in groups. Everybody will come together through the Red Cafeteria. Everybody is welcome. Presently, if you go on our website, uh, brocktonpublicschools.com, you will find a parent survey that asks eight simple questions. It asks your feeling about all of the things I just talked about. It asks what level your child is in the Brockton Public Schools. If you'd like to give us your email address, you can, so we can connect with you about this event coming up 
in any future events that we have with parents. But parents have been trained to meet in a small group with other parents to gather this information and we're gonna to start to look at your school committee and that is their number one role is to look at policies um, in our district and to obviously you know, be able to run our district with the support of our parents and input from our parents. So if by any chance, we've even looked at the weather a week ahead right now. The weather looks good, does not look like a snowstorm. So I would advise you, we will have babysitting that night if there are families that have young children, but we would like to get a showing and I believe right now we have a number of people that I think over 1,100 have taken the survey. You have until the 19th to complete the survey and to be part of the research. And also um, we have a number of parents, I think close to 300 that have signed up you know, to come to the event. It might even be more than that. But we are hoping for a good showing on the 24th if you can fit that in your calendar. And again, it'll be very different than this format where the superintendent is doing the talking, the parents are going to be doing most of the talking and gathering of the information. So please, uh, please put that on your calendar. Um, while I'm talking about the weather, um, you know, the winter is the winter. Those of you that have been in New England a long time know that I I'm actually very pleased uh, when I came on as superintendent, I wasn't sure exactly how you made a snow call. And it's a lot of information and I wanna tell you that our mayor has done an excellent job of putting together what we call BEMA, so it's Brockton Emergency Management, where when we see a prediction of snow like a week or so ago with the 16 inches, is we get together, it isn't the superintendent by themselves, we get together with the uh, Department of Public Works, we get together with the fire chief, the police chief, Brockton Area Transit, um, everybody that makes up our city to make a decision as far as what's going to happen. You know, we're going to have to close school because obviously the roads aren't safe. The plows are out there. We made the decision on that Friday. So we called off Thursday because of the storm. We knew that Friday our buildings are old. This building here is 60 years old. This wasn't necessarily one of them, but we had buildings struggling during that very cold snap to even get heat up to 65 to 68 degrees. So we have old buildings, something else that this city is going to have to face. We are going to have to look. These old structures can't continue to do like any of our homes. You know what happens after 60 years in a home, you're replacing that furnace. So we continue to do everything we can to build these facilities and support them with new roofs, with new windows, with new boilers. But there's only so much that we can do. So what we ended up doing was looking at that snow coming in and then looking at that temperature for Friday, knowing that we did not want children waiting for buses that might not start on time in the bus yard. So to me, that very much was a good call to support our students. Now, as far as this snow call went, you know, there was very little predicted, but these ones actually become very tricky when you talk about the rain snow line. You know, I can go to bed at two in the morning and it looks like, you know, the morning might be fine and you wake up and all of a sudden, you know, there's ice on the roads, there's, you know, snow, there's, it's predicted to continue. So these are very, very difficult calls. I think the parents have been fabulous. I get on that phone on the connected call myself because the one thing I want to say to you, and I don't want to say it each and every time, but I know you know this. If in fact we end up with a storm like last week, the large one, I really appreciate when you are out there at bus stop standing with your children when maybe you wouldn't be on a beautiful sunny day in the spring, but making sure that they're not playing in the street or can slip and you know, go into the street because the snow is piled so high. Work with your neighbors on getting kids to school. Work as a community to try to support our students, you know, during these times. We try and do everything we can to get the children into school. So um, I see some hands already going up. So uh, I think that's pretty much an update as far as what's happening in the district. Michelle, did I miss anything that uh, is up and coming? Okay, so again, um, a very good take is if you do have an eighth grader and you're looking to send your child, as we would like, to Brockton High School, I believe you just said February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. That's easy to remember. 
6 o'clock in the auditorium. So that's a nice way to show your child how much you love them. So anything else, or I will start to open it up for questions. OK, uh, let me open it up for questions. I saw, first of all, a hand down back. I don't know if you have to sign up for that. OK, do, um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think you have to sign up as a parent. Yeah, let me see. Just to call here. Just take okay. a look here. That's fine. It says right here. Yeah, good. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can you do me a favor when you speak? Do we have a microphone for parents that are asking questions? So everyone can hear the question. Would you please uh, let us know your name, if you will? It's not mandatory, but at least it lets us know in what um, where your children are in school. And you don't even have to have children in school to be here this evening, but if you do, we'd like to know that. Hi, my name, my name is Ivali. Um, and my question is about uh, when we're speaking about the winter and standing at the bus stop. I usually drive my daughter to school. I'm wondering if there's any way that you can ensure that the neighboring towns clear their paths because I see a lot of uh, students walking on the street and they're like either in the sidewalk and then they're back and forth between the sidewalk and the street because not everyone has cleared their path. Is there anything we can do about that? Okay, so a couple of things. One is, when you talk about clearing the path, you're talking the sidewalk. So two things that we're finding. We do have a number of vehicles in the city that are, I don't know if you've seen them, the sidewalk plows. So they are out there as soon as we get the roads and the roads are safe for people to travel. That's the number one uh, priority when you have a snowstorm. So they immediately get out there as soon as they can to do the sidewalks. Usually, let me do, for instance, Forest Avenue. But we don't have these beautifully manicured sidewalks. There's bumps, there's trees and roots that get in the way, and it makes it very, very difficult. They do their best to make the sidewalks getting closest to the school, and of course, those are for the walkers. But you ask a very good question. I do not know if we have a city ordinance, and there are some towns that make it mandatory for you to clear out in front of your house, for you to clear out that pathway. I know the mayor has been out there asking people to clear out the fire hydrant, to clear out the walkway, and sometimes even when this is done, and we can do a better job, the school committee last night asked that we have the DPW uh, come before us and just have a discussion about the sidewalks, what we can do to make sure that when plows are plowing, they're not putting large mounds in places kids stand. They don't know that that might be a bus stop. So we are trying to have better communication in that way. But one thing that we're finding, and I don't know if you're seeing it, the sidewalk could be plowed, and what do you think the students are doing? They're walking in the street. So I have driven down Forest Ave. That sidewalk is done. And whether they have sneakers on, I don't know if they have the proper footwear. I don't know if they just feel like, and, and we know as drivers, how risky it feels when you're driving by a student. We had a young girl uh, on one of our streets last week after the big storm. She stopped, and the car was not going fast. And it looked like the little girl was going to run out, but she stopped. So the car continued at a very slow pace. But the child must have thought the car was then stopping and ran out and hit the car, basically. So it becomes, you know, really uh, very concerning when you know we, we don't have the room that we would like for the car to go down the road for the children to walk to school safely so please talk to your students we're talking to them in schools and you make a very good point about if you are on a pathway you know going to any of the schools in your area you know please try to clean out that sidewalk and for everybody out there that is watching it really makes a difference to some of these young children and our older children if you just clear that area in front of your house. So thank you. Other questions? Yeah, you were talking about the sports kindergarten. So I have uh, a boy that will go to kindergarten in 2019, and he'll be five December 4th. So it, it looks like he will lose a year. He will. Because it's one, it's right. December 1st. Yeah, so he will be the so oldest the next year. 
you'll be what one of the oldest the students. Plan? You have any plan? No, there is no plan. The plan is very clear. The plan is that if your child is five this year by November 1st, so if your child is five on November 2nd, they do not go to kindergarten this year. They are part of our preschool. So same thing with your September 1st birthday in 2019. If your child is five by September 1st, they will be part of our kindergarten class. If not, they will be part of the next year's kindergarten class. We will be offering preschool. We're trying to really build that. That will be a half day program. And many times what parents need to do is, is whether you need to supplement, um, whether it's a daycare issue, whether it's an issue of just wanting more for your child, especially if they're a little older. And at that point, that would be considered a little bit older. You just missed the so-called cutoff date. Those of you growing up, when I grew up, it very much was in most towns that December 31st date. And there were plenty of kids that were January 1st babies. They did not get to go to school if they didn't have that December 31st birthday by five. So it's, it, it is a cutoff. Um, I've heard parents say to me, my child is already reading. Can't they start kindergarten? While I would like to say, we're thrilled if your child is reading. We're thrilled if your child is academically advanced. That's a very good thing for your child and certainly a very good thing for the Brockton Public Schools when they come into our district and be students that are very successful. But at this point here, the cutoff date is the cutoff date. So I'm sorry, I'm happy to talk to you about opportunities uh, at another time as we get closer. I have another question. Um, I don't know if it's that true. I heard that the number of children in the classroom this year is going up. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And is there anything to do with the cut? Well, it, it definitely does. So the question is um, that the number of children in our classes, so we watched very carefully our kindergarten classes, our elementary, our middle school, and our high school. And I can't tell you across the board because it really does depend on the class. One of it might have been an elective class where if you're talking about the older grades, maybe not everybody was taking advanced biology. So that class might have had smaller numbers than not. But when you talk about the kindergarten classes, what had been an average for us of about 22, 23, all of a sudden in some of your schools, highly selected schools or schools that have large neighborhoods feeding into it, the numbers were sometimes 27 and 28 in a kindergarten class. We find that unacceptable. And that was clearly cutting of 80 teaching positions across the district. There are some schools, when you hear me say that, that actually, again, because of our choice, because of where people are living, I know, the, <clears throat> I know the Downey School had very reasonable class sizes. I believe there they were 20, 21, 22 in a class, when I think the Hancock or the Kennedy, uh, the Brookfield was another one, I think the Baker was another one, those classes were 26, 27, and much larger. And I'm just using kindergarten as an example. So that is exactly the result of a $16 million budget deficit and 80 teachers. Because by the time you cut everything you possibly can, and then you have to start looking at personnel, there's nowhere else to cut, and you try to find a balance. Maybe you don't get the technology that we need in the district. You heard me talking about that. So that we can make sure our priority is to do what we can to make sure there's a teacher in front of every one of our students with a reasonable class size. I find the class sizes I just shared with you not where we would like them to be. So the school committee, we worked all summer <clears throat> looking at funds that were coming in, whether through grant funding and a number of those funds were cut. We continually watched the state funding coming. It was not supportive of our budget. We looked at our city funding coming in and although the city met foundation, it was not enough. So with that, we struggled and were the only department in the whole city that had any kind of a layoff. And when I mention 80 teachers, that's not including the percentage of custodians, the percentage of paraprofessionals, monitor teacher assistants, administrative assistants, administrators that we cut throughout the whole district to make up that deficit.
Um, my name is Miranda. Um, and my children attend the Arnhem School. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned that you're looking to have, um, eventually have devices, um, whether tablets or computers. Right, one to one. Eventually. When you're increasing that, are you increasing your, um, your tech staff, teachers for teaching that? Because I was at the last school committee meeting and I heard, or not yesterday, yes. the previous one, yep. and I heard um, the uh, IT department come up and speak to that, that they are in dire need of an extra staff to be able to yep. help out. So I'm just concerned that if you're looking to get these computers, are they even going to be able to be used because if you don't have the staff to support them, whether it's technical support or teaching the children mm -hmm. how to use them or teaching the staff to teach the children how to use them, I'm concerned that it's going to be yep. a new point. An excellent, excellent point. So when you are talking about our goal of having in the hands of every student from the time they're in kindergarten to start to learn the keyboard, what does the mouse do? They have to be comfortable that if we're expecting them to take a high stakes test when they're in 10th grade, that they're able to maneuver with the computer, are very com comfortable with it, and are using it every day in their work. So when we talk about increasing, and we are doing a good job, we're not there yet with getting what we call laptop carts. I'd like to have one in every single classroom throughout the district, that when the student comes in, they have that laptop with them for the day. That's their one-to-one -one device. But in doing that, you also need, and there was a conversation with our school committee, I think it is about two weeks ago, I believe it was maybe late December or early January, I'm losing track. Okay, thank you. Where we had our technicians come and share with us the stress that they are under. Because you start out with maybe with 18,000 students in the district a number of years ago, maybe there are 5,000 devices, and those are just students. There's also teacher devices, there's also administrative devices. And as soon as those devices go down, they need to be deployed. So many things, we're talking about bandwidth, all of those things, you need that additional staff to support the devices. And in turn, you need instructional support to make sure that the teachers are integrating that in their day-to-day -day lessons and are comfortable doing that. So as we look at a budget this year, that is going to be one of the issues that we face. I don't have an answer for that. Well, I was just concerned because at the middle schools, there's no computer lab teachers anymore, and there's no uh, certified library teachers, and it's been like that for at least 10 yep. years now. And at the elementary schools, you've got more certified library teachers down in paraprofessionals in the computer labs. It depends on where you are as to what kind of getting, and my understanding is those are going to be phased out for next year. So my concern was that they're not getting that teaching the certified teachers wouldn't be able to do that. Well, hence the discussion. I'm not a fan of computer labs. Back in the day, there was something to be said for computer labs, but if you look at high-performing districts, they're no longer computer labs. The children have them at their desks. They're one-to-one -one devices, and that's what every teacher is teaching with. From any of your content area teachers, you could be using it in a gym class if there's something that you're trying to figure out, but truly, you know, it, so the days of a computer lab, we should not be having that as a district. Our concern should be in those classrooms. We do have a technology plan. We have not been able to implement it, and part of the technology plan is to, when you're deploying these devices, you have staff that grows, and also we would want instructional technology teachers working in every one of the buildings with our teaching staff with professional development to be going over all of the technology with our students as to how to, how to research, you know, how to write an essay, how to, um, so many things, so many things that they do with the computer. You see them in your own homes if you're using them with our students. So we do not have equity throughout the district. Um, what we're trying to do is, especially with the students in testing grades, we might have shared computers for students in kindergarten classes where we're trying to make sure that the one-to-one -one devices and our known, I know, just received. I'm not sure if we've deployed them. I'm looking at James down back. Uh, we'll start deployment uh, of the high school and also after the next week, we'll get the other So we're continuing to try to provide for grades three, four, five at the elementary level, obviously our middle schools, and on to our high schools. So we are trying to get them as young as we can and making sure that the devices are in the classrooms. But I will tell you something. I have heard that there's no appetite, and those of you that understand a Prop 2.5 override, 
what it does is it talks about a tax levy on every one of our homes. And when I went before the city council last spring and talked about, and, and it just struck me, I was in Dunkin' Donuts, and in front of me, every, uh, everybody was leaving with big drinks, and I'll never forget one gentleman came in, and he actually was a construction worker. And I kind of paid attention because he had a board. He probably took it from the construction site, and on it was every coffee and all kinds of things. And he must have left there. I can't tell you how big the order was. But what struck me is every day all of us go out. I get my big cup of tea, I should say, at Honeydew every day. And, you know, I spend probably $3 on that. You know, people might get a bagel or they might get a donut to get them through the morning. You're talking probably about $5. If our taxes went up in a year, and I understand the stress. Some of you are out there probably working two and three jobs. My husband and I did that our whole lives. And I understand what it is to pay taxes and own a home and clothe your child, put food on the table. So I'm not dismissing that. But when I look at the money that we spend on, and I used, and I'm picking on the coffee, and, the, and I probably shouldn't, but it's just easy to pick on. And I look at that amount of money. If you took once a week $5, and you put it aside for the average household for $100 additional to support technology, to support a reduction in class size for our students, I disagree that there is not an appetite for a prop two and a half override. I believe, I don't care if you're somebody elderly and you don't have children in schools, but you own a home. You want that home to be worth it for somebody else to come in and want to buy in Brockton to make sure that we're providing, like I said, fire and police, and most importantly, an education for your children if you're building a family in this city. So those are the kinds of things that we have to really make a decision about. And nobody wants to, it's like a bad thing, taxes. I'm not sure when it became a bad thing. It's what we've all lived on in order to provide our students with what they deserve. And you look at your neighboring towns. You tell me how many towns have refused to do an override to support a new high school in their towns. Somebody tell me a town around that hasn't supported it. West Bridgewater, beautiful new high school. East Bridgewater, new high school. And don't forget that the high schools we all had, we all built when the baby boomers started in the 60s. That's when we built Brockton High and East Bridgewater and all of those high schools. Those high schools are not supporting 21st century education for our students. So we as a city need to be able to make some decisions about this. Is it worth it for us to match Middleborough that's out there building a new high school? Stoughton has started construction. Holbrook is almost finished. Easton added on, I believe, to all of Reims and renovated. There's not a, a school, Whitman Hanson, new high school. There's not a school, Abington, new middle, senior, junior high school. I was there a few months ago when the commissioner came to speak, beautiful. And they did an override or a debt exclusion. So we have to ask ourselves as a community, and I've heard there's not a political appetite for it, and I ask why. Why isn't there a political appetite for this? It benefits our homeowners, it benefits our students, and frankly, it's the right thing to do. So those are really tough decisions that politicians are going to have to make, and we're going to have to have some discussion about it. So these are things, again, we've got the equity in education lawsuit, we're talking about advocacy for Title I funding, we're talking about making sure our children have the facilities that they deserve, and yes, we might be talking about a Proposition 2.5 override in the city. How did it 
did it come how did it come to this? The research is there, but rather than or what I've been feeling is I get the almost like how you responded tonight, like there it seems like it's pretty much what it is. And it's hard to hear that as a new parent because I'm trying to figure out my place in the school system to where our voice can be heard or how can we become a part of the plan, especially when you say there is no plan. So it's kind of like, oh, well, how can parents become a part of the plan to maybe adjust to the change? Because I'm almost feeling a little bit like my daughter, who my doctor is saying is ready, who her preschool daycare um, teacher is saying is ready, and then when it's time to go to school, it's kind of like this cut off, like, no, that's it, it's what it is, and there's no plan, but I want to be a part of the plan, I guess, to figure out how the, those suburb babies that are in that November, December, how can we not have it seem as though we're leaving them behind in a way, and this is a new plan, and of course other towns have had this for years, but they've had it for years. And so for us, it's, or for me, it's very new, and um, it's hard to hear. And so my question is, how can parents become a part of just helping to plan or be a part of the plan that goes into that now, moving forward? And then when I hear about, you know, the cutoff dates have been December 31st. And if you were going to just January 1st, it's almost as though we're going back to the 60s and 70s on how kids were raised back then. In a world now today, it's different. Like there's technology, there's homeschooling on the rise, there's different things that parents are doing or not doing that don't relate or apply to those old ways the cutoff dates have been set back then. And so my, when I'm thinking of this, I'm like, well, gee, my daughter is born on November 13th. Yes, it is 12 days after November 1st, but could there be testing that could be done because this is a new system, not just for my daughter, but for any of the parents that feel like, well, you know, I pretty much expected my daughter to go to kindergarten this year, so it's so is there a way that the, the children, whose parents and doctors and people, because there's no way to tell that they're not, I guess. I called um, and I spoke to, we called the for, um, Crescent Street and they told us to talk to our city council. Didn't hear back from the city council, I spoke to another city council who we actually know. I'm not sure who would say city council. Well, if that's okay. Mm. We got that run around and we ended up talking to a bunch of different people and it just seemed as though in, in every single conversation we had, I just felt like it was just this shutdown and it's like, well, where do we get to say something about this? It's like I get the cutoff, but where can we begin to have conversations on how to move forward with the way it is now, rather than there is no plan, mm -hmm. that's the way it is, so it's like, okay, so just deal with it. Well, okay, let me answer first of all. I'm not sure what you mean there is no plan. So I started out by saying a lot of research has gone into this for years in our district. Last year, we brought together research from all over the state, looking at districts, 351, I could be wrong as to how many, it might have been 353, and there were three districts that did not have September 1st based on research of how children developmentally are successful in a full day program. Two things I want people to know, kindergarten is not mandatory in the state. It is not mandatory that any school system provides any kindergarten at all. The mandate is first grade through 12th grade. That being said, Brockton was at the forefront many years ago of going from, you heard me talk about my children that are 35, excuse me, 34, she'll kill me if I say that, <laughs> 34 and 31, when they entered kindergarten, it was a half-day program back then. And we were very pleased as a district, sometimes because of we had numbers of English language learners and we wanted to get them into school for a longer period of time so we could start the process of learning the English language. Some children, 
that did not have experiences maybe with a preschool or parents that were supporting their education to get them in and to start to do letter recognition or number recognition. And we went to a full day program, and not for everybody. For a while, we had a lottery system. Once we were able to go full-scale kindergarten, and we kept our cutoff date at the time, there was always discussion about moving it back. And many times it became a money discussion also. And we felt very, very strongly about wanting to start a preschool program in Brockton because we were finding those so-called Burr babies were honestly developmentally not ready for a full day of kindergarten. They were students that were being left behind. They were students that were falling asleep. They were students that were unable to sit for longer periods of time with the attention span that they needed for very specific objectives and skills that they had to learn. So in doing that research, we put all of this in front of our school committee. We continued to have lengthy, lengthy discussions about it, and a vote was taken and a decision was made to roll it back, not to just rip the Band-Aid off and say we're going back to September 1st, and the other part of that was we felt our first time doing a preschool program, we wanted to be able to look at, and as I said to you, it's about 100 a month that make up your school year for students. So however that works, it ended up being on average about 100 students born every month of the year that makes up our average is about 1,200 students in a class. Sometimes they're a little bit larger, sometimes a little bit smaller. So in doing that, we felt that for the first year we could focus on, which is why I'm saying there is a plan, we could focus on about 200 of those youngsters to do a preschool program. It will be a half-day program in the city. We're working with outside providers such as Brockton Day Nursery, Westfield Daycare, the Head Start program. Because many of these youngsters might spend preschool a half a day with us, and then they might go back to another program their parents have them enrolled in. So we very much have a large task force going on throughout the city with community providers, our own experts in early childhood, making the decisions about what a preschool curriculum would look like versus our kindergarten curriculum. Although I absolutely respect your concern, and I understand it, I would have felt the same way. You're looking forward to something, you moved to Brockton, that was the cutoff date, we announced it a year ago, and talked about as soon as the vote was taken with the school committee, and announced that it was coming. And our plan was, again, to make sure we had a safeguard for those 200 children, at least for the preschool. For the next year, we will go back to that September 1st date. And although it sounds progressive to talk about, there are probably students that are right now, well, of course, we're beyond the December 31st date, but I probably had students in the Brockton Public Schools that were the so-called Burr babies this past fall. There were some that couldn't keep their heads up every day. There were some that truly were not ready for that kindergarten experience. And yet there would have been a number of them that are, you know, uh, typically developing, uh, have a lot of language, you know, are starting to do, you know, recognizing letters, reading, et cetera. And each of you knows your child, and I'm sure your pediatricians do. So we are doing the very best we can to make decisions for our district. It cannot be on a case by case basis. That's not how any district is run. It's certainly not going to be how the Brockton Public Schools can run. But we do want to have involvement with parents in making these decisions about what our kindergarten looks like so our children can be successful. Because I hope you did hear me in all honesty. When you talk about some of those 13 year olds entering Brockton High School, we do not feel we have a large high school. And right now, if you ask me honestly, and I'll never be around to see this, we probably should have two separate high schools in our city. 4,200 kids, and although I'd invite any one of you to come in and see our large high school that we are very used to working with with your four houses, I do not feel it's an optimal experience. You're trying to get to know the kids, you're trying to manage a large group, and to have a 13-year-old in there is becoming difficult. And when we see those children in ninth grade that do not succeed, and end up failing a number of their classes, a lot of them are the so-called Burr babies. So this is the research done year after year after year. So I understand the frustration out there. The decision was made with a lot of input, a lot of discussion. 
We brought in uh, the Department of Education to talk about, again, what a preschool opportunity would look like. And we'll continue to, to work with the community, but I know nobody wants to hear it, but there is a cutoff date at this point. It's November 1st for this coming year with a preschool opportunity for those students that will be the 200 that are so-called left behind. And the year after that, it will be a September 1st cutoff date. So I'm happy to speak to you separately. I know there's a lot of concern out there. Yeah. And when you do call the office, if you call central administration, I wish I could tell you I could take every phone call. And believe me, there are nights I stay there and I try to call parents back if I think it's something that the superintendent needs to address. But I do have very capable executive directors, head of our early childhood, that I am asking to have conversation with parents. As far as the city council goes, your elected officials are your school committee that are making policy decisions for our schools. And I know, even looking out at Judy and Tim, I know you have ward meetings, I know you're out there, I know you're available to parents if they're calling you. So your school committee in the future they're always available and as I said you have a very active school committee that um, you know spends quite a bit of time on on many of these issues any anybody else that I haven't heard from oh sorry I don't know if it's me. <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. Okay, um, so I volunteer to do the traffic duty at the Raymond School. And I want to let you know that it is very chaotic, it is unsafe, and it's just, it's beyond your imagination. And it's not because of the school fault. Um, Mrs. McGrath is doing a great job. The buses are now on the other side of the school. But my main concern is that um, there's a lack of common sense. It's also the parents. It's not the kids. So I saw two kids say I was getting hit by a car because the parents are texting on the phone instead of helping the kids in their car. We need to have a better, efficient way to have parent pickup. And I want to know if there's anything you can add or any the staff can add to make it better, efficient, easier, less frustrating. A lot of complaints that I get from parents is that uh, there's a lack of parking. And it's true. And I mean, they can take the initiative and yeah, they'll park at the dollar across the street, but that's not ideal. No one wants to do that. So I'm just saying, is there any way you can help us? And also, I wanted to add, um, parents are also verbally abused, the staff. And I've witnessed this myself, calling them derogatory names, uh, just being very intimidating, and then coming out to the staff. And I want to know, uh, do you have a policy where the staff can stand up for themselves in a professional way without having the fear of their job security? Okay, so let me answer a couple of things. One is, when you talk about schools, and we talked about how old a number of our schools are, so the Raymond School, I believe, opened up in 74, 75. I can't remember the Davis. I can't remember which one came first. I think it was the Raymond in 74. The reason I say that is back then we had neighborhood schools. Kids were expected to walk to school. Most of the kids walked. Parents didn't give a thought about somebody out there snatching them or somebody out there doing something to them. It is a totally different world we live in. And parents have cars. And it used to be a time where mom stayed home. Maybe the family had one car. I lived during that time. But now parents have lots of cars. You know, Each parent has a car. They're probably both working. And what's happening is our schools weren't built for the traffic that comes in there every single day. It's a problem. And I also fault us because even schools we built in the past five or so, well, actually it's more than that now, eight or nine years, the Baker and the George School, we've built them on a postage stamp because that's the kind of space we had in the city. And instead of looking ahead and saying we need large parking lots or we need to make sure we have a pattern where the buses and the cars you know, can go through. The only success we have had, and it's a problem, is we've brought in Lieutenant Mills who oversees our school police department. And he will bring in his school police officers to work with the principal and to come up with a way that cars come in, the way they go out, the way they drop the children off. It's very much staff hands-on. 
So in other words, there isn't a lot of time when it comes to the time for your car to move up to the spot where you can let your children out safely. We then expect you leaving, not coming after your child because they forgot their lunch in the car. So these are the kind of things that, and it's not easy, I, I agree with you, but um, I was just at the Raymond, I wanna tell you, I do a visit at every one of the schools where I bring the entire executive team. That's everybody, and our goal is to hear what the challenges are in the school, what their successes are, and how we can support the schools. So I was just at the Raymond, and I can't tell you how pleased I was with the academics going on, with not only some of the challenges that we're addressing, but looking at some of your very successful programs there. I love your uniforms there. I know that that's not popular with a number of parents, but I have been very pleased with looking at you know, some of the changes I think that have happened at the Raymond. Now addressing the uh, conversation, but I will follow up with Principal McGrath and make sure that, and I'm sure she knows that Lieutenant Mills is available, and basically he comes in with his team and they kind of look at the patterns that are happening. And is there a way so that we're not affecting the traffic out on uh, Oak Street? You know, is there a way that we can make it a little bit better and safer for children? As far as the texting goes, I don't know about you, but it is very scary when you're driving and you're looking at, and you can very much see somebody going by you the other way that kind of veers into your lane, and all of a sudden you realize that they're paying attention to their phone one way or another. It is very, very scary. As far as the disrespect, I am sorry when I hear that. There should never be disrespect, and it's never about somebody's job. It is about professionalism. I expect our teachers to deal with every parent who is our partner in education. You send us your children, your beautiful children, and it is our job to also do everything that we can to make sure their day is a very positive day, that they're part of a social environment where they can make friends, they can learn social skills, and they can succeed academically. So that is my expectation, first of all, with the staff when you talk about professionalism. On the other hand, when you are a parent and you're frustrated about something, and obviously you're seeing frustration in a parking lot. Yes, um, from the parent to the, the staff, the teacher, whoever, and to myself, I want to be able to No, you're certainly correct. I'm just, as you're talking, I'm trying to think of ways, whether we have our students at the high school put together a public service announcement that we put on our cable station, and hopefully parents are putting on the cable station in our local community and looking at things that are causing us concern. Because you bring up a valid point, and I'm sorry that people are speaking that way, and I guess it's a check for any one of us listening, or certainly those of you that are here, to understand just what I said, the parking locks weren't built for all of the cars that we have, and we're doing everything we can to get our children in and to get our children out safely. So I thank you for your volunteering. I know we've had a number of opportunities for parents to come in and support in ways such as, I'm sorry, what was your first name? Jenny. Jen, Jenny is doing. Uh, we just had elderly uh, in our district who are getting tax rebates actually go through a program where they are donating hours to help out in the lunch rooms and to help out on the playground with our children. So we're very pleased about offering, you know, volunteer hours for people willing to come in and, and to support our community. And while I'm saying that, let me also give a plug for businesses. If there are businesses out there that want to support our schools in any kind of a meaningful way, whether if you're a landscaping company and you want to support some landscaping at one of our schools, or you have a special skill set or a business that you can support some of the initiatives after school, uh, additional um, 
programs for our students. We certainly welcome those businesses to, uh, to uh, get in contact with us. We do have a nonprofit, Brockton Foundation Education, where we certainly can give a tax write-off for any of those services that are provided to us. So can, can I also say one thing before, uh, I, and again, I'll open it up if there are still questions. We still have some time. I do want to address, as I look out at our community, and I addressed this, uh, addressed this last night at the school committee meeting. I don't want to get into politics, although you can tell just by hearing me speak that unfortunately politics is what we do. And I was very, very concerned when I heard coming from our nation's capital that there were comments made about countries and places where actually when you live in Brockton and you know what the countries are that are part of our larger community. And I don't know about you, but I do know that my family came many, many years ago from Italy. And I heard the story from my mother about having to change their name so that you couldn't tell it was an Italian name and that the parents insisted that they didn't speak Italian, that they had to learn English so they could interpret for the parents. They didn't want the children to have an accent. They wanted to make sure because there was prejudice around. And sometimes you think you've moved beyond that. But when I hear about comments made, and I want to tell you that when I go around those classrooms, so when you talk about particular countries and you make statements that are, I'm, I'm trying to think of the terms that were used and I'm not talking about the word itself, whether it was vulgar terms or, or I spoke very harshly. All of that is unacceptable. So for every child you're talking about, and I want you to picture if you came from one of those countries, and you're a little first grader sitting there, and we're teaching about the respect for the presidency in our country, something we're so proud of. We're so proud of our democracy. We teach about a constitution. We teach about checks and balances. We get up and we pledge allegiance. We have special holidays where we commemorate you know, the patriotic nature of our country. So I want people to understand that I find that unacceptable as superintendent. And people need to speak out when things are unacceptable. Every one of our children and every one of our families are welcomed. It brings rich, rich diversity. And I'm out there watching these students. I'm out there when we bring a new language program, such as at the Raymond School. We brought in little, little kindergartners learning to speak English that are speaking Portuguese in their homes, and children that are Portuguese speaking learning English, English learning Portuguese. And the one thing that I hear is after years of this teaching, we have a Spanish program at the George School, a dual language program, where the children are actually able to communicate with their friends and their friends' families. They'll be able to communicate with the businesses that make up our community. So I want to be clear that we value the diversity of our school district. We are very proud of the countries that our children come from. We put flags outside of our city hall, and I joined the mayor, who also came out with a very strong statement in saying that we don't have any place for any kind of di divisive rhetoric that we have heard over the past two weeks. And I couldn't leave here this evening without saying that to each and every one of you. We want all our children, whether they're little children coming from Puerto Rico, where half the country still doesn't have electricity. I don't know if you saw it the other day, but they showed a video of a school with children clapping and screaming because the electricity finally came back on after having gone out in late September. So these are the children that we support. These are the children that we welcome. And we will always do that. And I am so proud of our district that is accepting of everybody that comes through our doors. Sorry. Is this something that the school contains all around so that they can learn what their contributions are? We could do a better job. So the question is, are our children learning about all of the places that they come from, the people that have been very successful? 
while we do a good job, I will say that right now we have our uh, Chief Officer of Student Support Services, uh, Sharon Wolder, who has put together a task force. I believe there are community members involved, there are teachers that are involved, that are looking at our district and making sure that we have culture. We have a diversity task force uh, made up of a number of community members, some administrators, um, actually a representative even from the Mayor's Diversity Commission serves on this board. They meet once a month, the first Monday of the month, and part of that has been developing a curriculum. So that we can, um, as I said, we do that, we certainly celebrate. You've got uh, Kelly Jones here from our bilingual department who will tell you that we spend a lot of time you know, in our classes celebrating our diversity and certainly talking about those things so that all our children here, not just our children in bilingual classes, but we could certainly do a better job and we are committed to improving on that. You talk about that, you should also be looking at your curriculum and your textbooks that you're purchasing. We haven't been able to purchase many new textbooks in the past five years I've been here. So as we do that, you put together a team that looks at the materials that you're purchasing and to make sure it is culturally sensitive. So you're showing you know, um, people of color that are successful, um, you know, running the whole gamut to make sure that we show the full picture. How many of you enjoyed, you know, I tell you I, I grew up in the 60s um, and when I saw the movie Hidden Figures with the three African American women that were part of, so I grew up during the space age. I can remember watching John Glenn and watching us racing with Russia, you know, to get to the moon. I remember when we reached the moon like it was yesterday. And yet I never heard these stories. You know, that's not, so to even hear those stories was so inspirational for all our children. But what it does tell us, as much as I thought I had a well-rounded education, there's so much more out there that we don't know. And we need to be sensitive to the fact that our children need to hear and see people that look like them that are teachers, people that look like them that are scientists, that are doctors, that are policemen, firemen, all of those things. So we continue to work on that. And um, I uh, reviewed a little bit about the background in regards to having an accident as a guidance counselor. Uh, you served also as an instructional counselor, uh, a BA special ed in, uh, in special education. That's where I'm going to be um, putting my focus on because I do have a daughter attending the therapeutic Huntington School mm -hmm. that has trans, um, transformed from the Goddard School for whatever the reasons are. As well as um, there's a reason why um, I'm, I'm pinpointed your educational and your experience background because I'm going to try to articulate to, to make my statement moving forward. I'm grateful to attend this first time um, school committee experience and hearing you and meeting you as you being the superintendent of the whole uh, community of Brockton. And um, as well as you, uh, you also have a, a Juris uh, doctorate from uh, in regards to the study of law. So you are well-rounded. The only element that I don't see is any emphasis on mental health. There's a reason why I state that. Um, I'm going to try to narrow it down. My daughter in, is a victim of trauma. As we all know, my, I'm born in the 80s, but I chose to live here. My peers, my family, they don't understand. I says, I'm a believer, I love the Lord, I believe in the community, and I believe I'm here for a reason. And I says, if I'm here, and I've sustained a lot by living here, then I'm far too vested uh, because of, of all the trauma and the situations that have transpired by residing here. So my daughter is a victim of trauma. She's been assaulted at the age of 12 in the city of Brooklyn. Okay, she has transformed and went through a whole array of process um, to bring her to an IP level. The Department of Mental Health was involved, um, various organizations. She even began to get homeschooled. Homeschool, um, which I definitely will look into outside of here because we are pressed for time, it means that a child has the equivalency of one hour for four days a week, which equivalents four hours per week. It equivalents a full schedule of school. I think that there's something questionable with that because now she's transitioned into a therapeutic school a year later um, with having some challenges in the adjustment, but returning to a structured curriculum um, environment. My daughter was brutally assaulted by a school officer. In the two years that, um, that my daughter has had um, her behavioral challenges, 
due to the trauma and assault, I have come across many great officers, sergeants, and captains who have assisted my child during her hardest moments immediately impact after trauma. But this is the first time I've ever encountered, I'm very dismayed, I'm very disheartened that when there was a safe plan, I'm a professional at that. I'm a healthcare professional, a childhood education professional. I'm not gonna lay out my background, but I'm very passionate as an advocate for all children that we entrust in the hands of society, that is entrusted God to me in my house, and for the school system that I said that if my daughter has to go to this therapeutic school, uh, for whatever reason, there were discrepancies and challenges with the guard, I'm gonna trust that they're going to adhere to a safe plan established by the Department of Mental Health, established by the crisis, and established by even our public school, public safety officers who attended the meeting, there was a safe plan. If at any point that there were measures that they were not able to control for whatever reason while mimicking an inpatient psychiatric facility to an extent that they have rooms like inpatient units have where they wanna send a kid for time out, then they have to call the mobile crisis team and get the appropriately educated individuals on the psychological and psychi psychiatric teachers because that means that they can't balance the situation. So what that initiated was the safe plan established that we all agreed was put to the side. Ma'am, ma can I can I can I, can I stop for a second? Is this a question and I'm very oh, no, much okay. so is I this talk? about your child? Because I'm happy to speak to you separately no, about okay, something so that's so um, we have reached, a, you have a $60, a $60 million deficit, okay, that takes away from the funding, that takes away from a lot of the support that can be entailed into your school systems, whether it's guidance, mm -hmm. whether it's adjustment, et cetera, or even enhance proper, if, if you're gonna label the school therapeutic, which means a process of healing, then you have to well run, it need money to invest in more mental health teaching. So where I'm getting at, is um, a lot of money also gets invested to now we have policing in the school. Uh, Brockton is known to utilize the public safety figure more like a, a 40% or more than the average norm than other cities that where, where children and students are, are going from schools to the criminal justice system as opposed to having adequate um, support in their challenges that may not be the norm. As far as my child goes, I do have an issue directly but indirectly because I represent every, every other child who has a mental health challenge. That no public officer who takes an oath uh, 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 in, in to say that I'm going to involve myself with a child should have had any reason to use un, uh, a reasonable amount of excessive force, unreasonable amount of excessive force to punch a child in the head where my daughter had blood all over. The re and I'm gonna end it there. Because of the fact that we all are, are saying that we're here for the betterment of, of our child, there's a mission and vision that also includes the emotional and social aspect of a child, then we have to have better support system in, in order to change the city, in order to change the community, in order to change a town or a city, a state or our country, we have to begin to address individuals. Not whether someone's wearing a bag, a baker, a cook. Not whether someone comes from Afghanistan, from Italy, from India, El Salvador, Dominica, wherever. We need to address and get out of our comfort zone and address every entity of an individual that makes the pool kind of hard to work with. So where I'm getting at with you, how has the deficit, how has being limited to actually strategically work with a big district where we have one of the biggest schools in the country as a high school. We are highly diversified within an array of cultures from whether they're coming from, from emergency or whether they, they choose them because something in Brockton says that there's hope. Yet we're not champions, but we can become champions. And that, what is your mission and vision with all of this, and number one, first and foremost, the areas of special education as you are highly educated in that field to protect our children and to say in whole that we have to find a way to better manage and support and meet all areas, um, areas from great books, great heritage, but get into the nooks and crannies of how can we uh, complete our mission so that they can be into society, into our you quote unquote, global society enter. They will not have a chance to enter global society if they're in our criminal justice system. That's all I have.
Okay, well, obviously you've brought up a number of things. Um, yeah, and, and it's difficult for me to go into every one of those areas. As far as our special education students, when we do talk about budget deficits, they are very much protected by their educational plan and what is mandated for them. For instance, if a child is in a substantially separate classroom, it dictates when you ask me how many students in a kindergarten class, a gen ed kindergarten class, that number could be 28, it could be 23. When you're in a special education setting, it is very much mandated by the state and our funds are used for those purposes. As far as our therapeutic school, I obviously will talk to you separately about your child, but that type of a setting is very much a substantially separate setting where we provide the mandates of an educational plan and are required by law to make sure if there is mental health support, if there's therapeutic support, if there's counseling support, small class size support, all of that is provided in our therapeutic school. If we can't meet the children's needs, everywhere from kids in gen ed to not only therapeutic, but also students that sometimes require an outside placement. And unfortunately, there are numbers of students in our district. It could be physical handicaps. It could be many types of trauma where our students do receive. As a matter of fact, there are many towns that look to mimic some of the programs, alternative programs. We probably have about seven or eight, and I'm not talking about the therapeutic school, which is part of our special education umbrella. As far as you mentioned police officers, we are very pleased that we actually have and it, it is a school police force. Although they have special police powers and are part of, they're a subset of the Brockton Police Department. In most cases, our police officers are out in the district working with our principals in very, very positive ways with our students and our families, developing relationships and making sure our schools are safe. Unfortunately, in society, and I'm not going to get into particular instances, we have had some situations where police come in because a student is a danger to themselves or a danger to somebody else. And that does require some force. Obviously, you use minimal force as much as you can. I hope we're not a pipeline to prison. That's something we very much try to remediate when you talk about children being successful at very young ages, having opportunities to socialize with other students, having opportunities to be on teams, involved in the arts, involved in the music. I talked to a parent that came in this evening, and I said to the parent who had changed schools, I hope you're involved with the parent group, because it makes a difference for your child to know other children, to be part of a greater good for our community, to make sure that we are supporting all of our children. So, you know, you ask me how in a large district I'm able to make sure that I can mandate all of the things that you so appropriately talked about, because it is what we want for all of our students. I stand here, and it isn't just my mission, it is the mission of the Brockton Public Schools. And when you hear me talk about what the school environments are like, I guarantee you, I am out in every school, I am meeting with the principals, I am hearing what they need for their supports, what their challenges are. And when I tell you it's not an easy job with a $16 million deficit, it's loud and clear tonight that I need your support in order to make sure that we have proper funding for our schools. So I'm happy to talk to you separately. And when you heard me say afterwards, I stay late hours, I will follow up with parents that have very specific questions about things that have happened that involve you know, personal information about their children. So I'm happy to follow up with you. Um, I have a parent here that hasn't had an opportunity. And then I'll come back to you to finish up. So what happens, we do have special education services in every one of our schools. 
Some of our schools are just for special education students. Uh, for instance, when you start out in preschool at our Barrett Russell, that is a school designed for special education students. We do allow some model students or typically developing peers to come in for students learning language skills or socialization, but that is one of our special education schools. When we talked about the Huntington Therapeutic School, that is a school where every student there has an individual educational plan, an IEP. Your next question was, with students that you're talking about, what happens when a child goes from an elementary level to a middle school level or to a high school level? So when you have an educational plan, it gives you a date as to when it has to be reviewed, that plan. Sometimes it means additional and extensive testing. Sometimes it could just be a progress update, depending on where you're at legally you know, during the process. We have all of this information through our special education department. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if it's once a month or every other month, they have special education, they call it CPAC, which is Special Education Parent Advisory Councils, like a special education PAC meeting, where parents come together and they'll share with us some of the concerns that they have. But we have, and please make sure that you connect with me, because we have information for the lay person, for parents, for grandparents, to understand exactly what the process is. And I'm happy to have one of our special education teachers or administrators, and it is important, especially if you're a grandparent, you know, understanding what the mandates are because it's very complicated, it's very legal as you brought up, but it very much has legal mandates, which is why I said our special education students have to be in, um, depending on what type of a class, there are mandates that we have to abide by by law in order for those kids to obviously progress and to deal with their individual plan that they have. So when you mentioned you have a student at the Champion and a student at the Ashfield, I think you said, does either student have an IEP? Okay, it, can, it should not have been dropped. I'm not sure if they had a meeting. I don't know if parents did or didn't attend, and then a decision was made that the students were no longer in need of special education services. But we can well, certainly... We struggling, though. I mean, I, I think that both, by the way, my, grand, my grandsons are struggling. How do you mm -hmm. get back into that program? Yeah. Well, again, the parent has a right to ask for uh, a team meeting where testing is done, teachers come together, staff, and a discussion is individual about your child and a plan is either put in place based on special education or a school looks at a gen ed student that maybe needs title one support. Maybe they need additional coaching. So there are things beyond special education that can be done. But again, I'm happy to follow up with you with special education so you can get some information. I think you'll find it very informative. And there is information for parents about the special education process. I'm sorry, what's an IEP? An IEP is an individual educational plan. So for every student whose parent, um, maybe you're noticing, it could be anything from my child's speech. The child seems to, to have a speech impediment, and I want the child looked at. It could be physical. Um, it could be academic. The child isn't progressing, and you think that maybe they have a reading disability, a learning disability that's getting in the way of their learning. So either the school will recommend it many times, a parent will say, I'm noticing it, there are information, there's usually a doctor's report, it could be a psychologist that tests the child, and all of this information is brought together in a team meeting where parents come together with school staff to look at all of this information about a child and a decision is made if they need additional smaller uh, class sizes or support because of their individual needs. That's your IEP, Individual Educational Plan. Sorry, I know you had your hand up. Um, I don't want to minimize all of the great points that you brought up, but I want to bring up just two of them because, again, I'm new to the system, so I'd like okay. to know, and it pertains to all students. Um, so do you have trauma-informed and sensitive uh, classrooms mm -hmm. via training, which is not something that should impact the budget deficit <coughs> because it's part of professional development? My next question is, is in terms of the school-to-prison pipeline, if that is a fact, um, 
I, it's great that you have police officers that are building relationships with the students, but inevitably they're trained uh, not towards restorative practices, but more punitive. Is, is there, do you guys have restorative practices that you use in the schools for, to avoid those types no. of incidents? This is what we have, uh, and when you heard me start out by saying we have a parent forum coming up to talk about discipline, there are situations, we are running a large school district, there are situations that require some type of a consequence. But what we do under Chapter 222, which is a law that came in back in 2014, and what it does is it makes sure that we do everything that we can for our children to remain in a public school setting, to make sure that we're working with parents, we're minimizing suspensions or expulsions, to make sure that the child receives the education, because we don't want the child dropping out. We don't want the child in prison. We want the child to be a productive member. The first thing you asked me, asked me about was trauma sensitive. Every one of our schools has professional development for our staff. We have received awards throughout the state. We're one of nine districts that is part of something called Excel, and it is a network of looking at social and emotional learning in every one of our schools. A number of our schools have PBIS, which is a way of making sure that a child understands the, the situation that they've gotten themselves in, what the consequence will be, so that the situation doesn't continue. And some of that is education for students, you know, understanding if they're disruptive even from the littlest ones in a classroom. Um, I've been around the school district where we don't have a lot of space. Schools weren't built to have space that we're looking to have. We have meditation rooms. I love where I have one of our adjustment counselors who actually trains, and we started with kindergarten students. This happened to be at the Brookfield School. I believe now this uh, school adjustment counselor is at the Baker School. And a room is set aside, a meditation room, where a child can come in, they can deal with some of the issues that might have caused them a problem in a particular class or a particular um, activity they were involved in. But the best thing was, and if you can imagine all little kindergartners when they have to change from being in a classroom to getting ready to go to music class. Their hands and feet are everywhere. They're pushing each other in line, trying to get to that number one spot. And they were taught breathing exercises. And to watch these little five-year-olds stand up and to take a deep breath, to make sure they had their own body space, you know, to be able to really kind of control themselves so they were ready to move on to the next activity. It was pretty amazing. And kids are telling us that when they get frustrated in a home environment with a brother or a sister or a parent, they're starting to deploy and sharing with their own parents ways to regulate themselves. So, you know, this is going on throughout the district. We have uh, school adjustment counselors that are presenting throughout the state with some of the best practices. You have one at the Arnon School. I know they just did uh, a presentation for me. It was an adjustment counselor from the Arnon, the Baker, and I'm trying to think of the other school. But, you know, this is something, again, we've been a district. There's lots more to do. You know, we're dealing with a society where trauma comes into our schools. Every single day, trauma comes into our schools. And what we're expecting our teachers to, to do, you bring up a good point, and we're talking to the colleges to make sure as you're training teachers, this should be part of the training because it isn't just the urban centers. This is happening all over. And it comes from the time our teachers are learning to be teachers to the time that you're actually dealing face to face, you know, in our schools. So. And Ms. Smith, I just want to say that I'm not necessarily pleased with the way that you articulately respond back. Um, I am satisfied with the answer in general that you give. But one other area that I think is huge, and I'm looking in here, this is a great big cafeteria, only designed for a middle school at the east side. Imagine how many more cafeterias are here without the parents who, when you have these types of meetings, I can say this is my first meeting, so I'm honest, but how does it reflect and contribute to the challenge? Because again, sometimes there are households that utilize the school system as a child care facility. I have to work, my kids can be there all day, and then in the end, we all have um, unique styles of disciplinary acts at home, behaviors where children pick up, the community, etc. How much impact and challenge does it bring when you have lack of community support, where we may lack in certain areas to contribute to this whole dynamic of change? Because it takes everyone 
has a role in this, including parents, whether single parent, double parent, grandparent, I cover it, I'm a single parent, I'm a grandparent, I'm a custody, et cetera. What can be impactful to assist that possibly can even enhance um, reasonable contributions of additional funding? You know, um, I, I think one of the most heartwarming things for me way back, I want to say two years ago, and most of you will relate to what I'm saying. So that was when we first realized that we had lost $6 million due to something called uh, direct certification. So a number of our children that were cataloged as students with free and reduced lunch, with, which brought additional money to our district for some of the very things we just talked about, social and emotional support, we were very frustrated with the state for only giving us funding for students whose families were on state assistance of some kind. And that's just putting it simply. So what we saw in this community is we got out in front of every school and we started a campaign. We begged for money from businesses because I cannot use school money for these kinds of initiatives. And we got money from WB Mason and a number of businesses there were people that contributed. We ended up with about $25,000. And we ended up buying stickers and signs. Who can tell me what those signs said? Brockton Kids Count. And I loved when, today, when I still drive around, and honestly, I need lots more support and I need lots more energy. But when I drive around and in my own neighborhood saw a sign on every lawn, I loved it. We had big signs in some of the businesses that were willing not only to put the sign there, but said, I want to support that and put that in front of my business. I want to put a bumper sticker on my car. I want to wear that T-shirt. We probably had close to, and really when you talk about 18,000 kids, we probably had 1,000 people up at the high school when we took the picture at the football stadium. But that was heartwarming that we started to bring people together. But you're correct that we need energy to be able to bring people that are educated, and I mean educated about the issues, to be able to put pressure. So when I heard somebody recently talk about calling city council, and I said to you, as far as policies go, it is your school committee. But your city council and your mayor make decisions, again, about funding of your schools. You do have power. Your power needs to be not only a contact to those four city councilors who, who work very hard for our city, and then every one of you has a ward that you live in that has another city councilor, that's 11 all together. You have a very powerful voice. And I know you depend on us to be able to talk to you about the intricate things about funding, which is very complicated for a school system. So when you do hear me talk about the frustration and looking at how do we get an additional hundred dollars on an average tax bill so that we're supporting whatever the initiative is whether it is additional support for social emotional learning whether it's making sure we have proper facilities for our students it does take the voters it cannot just be the superintendent up in front of the city council because once they meet foundation their obligation legally is done. But it's not done as far as the obligation to our kids. So if every parent, and you're talking about 18,000 kids, you multiply that by two, even if it's not a two-parent family, there's probably an aunt, there's an uncle, there's somebody out there that is part of this extended family that certainly could come together. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly talking about it. We feel like we're taking it a step at a time, dealing with the equity in education lawsuit. We very much are working on getting that done before the end of this school year. And I would like to see a group in the community come together from all over to talk about, if you believe it, there are some of you out there right now that might say to me, $100 in my tax bill puts me right over the edge and I can't support that. And I'm not saying it should even come to that. Why doesn't it come from our city dollars? Why does it have to come from a Proposition 2.5 override? Why can't the schools have the funding that they need to run our school district? So what, so what can so. we as parents do? No, it's okay. Now, I, I believe the answer, again, is, is political motivation on the part of all of us. But it can't just take a few people that are sitting here. 
So I guess it's incumbent upon the superintendent and those of us in the school district to make sure that we are getting people together. And maybe what we do is you've signed up here today, please make sure you're leaving your email addresses because we obviously are going to have to get, if this is something that we're going to do, and it doesn't just have to be an override, it should be a purposeful group of parents, of people in the community telling our elected officials that it isn't enough, that our schools need to, and you know what? I'm gonna tell you right now, here's where the blame is gonna lie. They're gonna tell you that our teachers' salaries are higher than other teachers and that's where the money's going to. And in fact, your teachers' salaries in Brockton, there are teachers' salaries, uh, for instance, that are higher than some of your suburban towns. But your teachers are teaching in an urban district. And we're expecting them to come in in the morning. We're feeding children. We're making sure that we're providing all the supports that we can for the very reasons we had discussions this evening. So I'll never apologize for what our teachers are being paid. We're paying them a wage that is, is pretty much the average wage throughout the state, maybe a little bit more in your urban districts. So that's going to be what's coming back. But you know, you can look at people that are paid in our city and the top people being paid are not necessarily your teachers. So that argument, argument falls on deaf ears as far as I'm concerned. So again, I do need the support of parents. Um, and when I say I do, I'm talking about the Brockton Public School children need the support of our parents. I know we have a, a parent here. Um, so earlier you had mentioned how as a parent can you get involved so that way going forward you can be part of the plan. Um, I recently as a parent started attending the school committee meetings. I said that I attended one beginning of January, I attended one in December. I find as a parent that's a way for me to stay informed. My concern is looking through the booklet that we have here, and I've gone to the website as well. It's hard to figure out which schools are attached to which um, school committee board member. Um, because when we choose schools, it's by zones, but I don't necessarily know which schools are in specific wards, and it's not listed anywhere specifically. And I did look into it before I came here to ask yep. the question. So um, that would be helpful that, you know, now I know that the Rangan School is um, Ward 7, which is you, Mr. Sullivan, mm -hmm. and I know that the Arno is Ward 4, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's pertaining to right. me. But if I have, as my children move right. and they have the different buildings, it's hard to keep okay. track of what ward is which. Okay. And can I say this as much as, and this is important to know, you know, Judy Sullivan is Ward 5. So if you're, you, your children might go to East Junior High, which is in Ward 5, but maybe you live in a different ward and your elected official, who when you're calling up and say, if you expect my vote, I expect you to support whatever. But you, more importantly than your school members, who I can tell you continue to support every extra dollar for education. These people are out there talking to your state officials. They're beside me when we're advocating for additional money. They met every Tuesday night this summer, every single Tuesday night, didn't matter if it was school committee, so that we could rebuild our district waiting to find out we were so dependent on state funding, so dependent on maybe that possible grant funding that might have come forward, none of it that came forward. You heard me mention the 250,000 that was all that we ended up getting additionally in the state budget that came through. So our advocacy has to be at a city level because you heard me talk again about the money coming from our city. It isn't enough to just meet foundation and do the minimal effort. You need to go above and beyond and not just a couple of hundred thousand dollars. You're talking about other smaller districts that say, our districts need, well, I'm using this as an example, one-to-one -one devices, we'll put another million dollars in our budget because that's what we believe as a community our children need. That's the kind of support your school committee members need and that needs to come from the mayor, it needs to come from the city council, we need to continue to work with our state delegation and they work very hard for us, believe me. It is not falling on deaf ears when I mentioned your representatives, when I mentioned Senator Brady, you know, they're doing what they can. I get very frustrated with our governor. You know, our governor has come in. He's been a big proponent of charter schools. And it's no secret I am not a proponent of a charter school. 
if a charter school comes in and wants to provide something different than we are providing in the Brockton Public Schools, and there are opportunities for charter. There are some students that don't make it in a public school system and needs to have different autonomies. I would have been happy to have that discussion, and that is draining dollars from our coffers. And it, you know, again, it would take me another whole evening to sit here and have that discussion. But those are the kind of discussions. You have a gubernatorial, a governor's race coming up. And I want you to be careful about what the commitment is from Governor Baker to your urban centers. And I was very frustrated back in the last election. And the governor wasn't running. But how many of you remember there was a charter question on the ballot? And you had money coming in from big businesses supporting charters. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, some illegally. They're still dealing with people that were hiding money and were elected officials on the Board of Education overseeing our whole state Board of Education and making decisions about charter schools. And I was very frustrated when you have a governor who goes out there when they saw the question wasn't going to pass. Does anybody remember how the question went down? It was a 60-40 split. 60% 60 of people all over the state said no. We have enough charters, there's enough seat capacity over here if parents want to have that choice, and we want to keep a strong public school system that has accountability with school representatives that you choose, not run by a board of directors. That, that every dollar they spent is overseen by the state. We account for every one of those dollars. So when a governor comes on, I love sports radio. I don't know how many of you listen to sports radio. So every morning, that's what I put on getting ready. And I was never so frustrated to hear the governor come on right before the election when they knew that question was going down and made a comment to everybody out there across the state. Those are people from all your suburban surrounding towns. But we were listening in the urbans. And his comment was, those of you that are worried about this, it doesn't really affect your schools. Well, what schools was he talking about? There's only nine communities that it affects. And the communities were the Brocktons, they were the Fall Rivers, they were the Fitchburgs, they were the Lowells, they were the Bostons. So what does that tell you? Those are the large urban districts. Why aren't there charters in the suburban towns? Because they want the strength of their public schools to be in public education in their community. So when you have a governor, that is supporting raising the seat capacity, and I'm standing here as your superintendent telling you it's draining dollars from our very children that are sitting in 27 students in a kindergarten class, the governor needs to hear that that's not okay. So we might not think that we have a voice, but you do have a voice. There's an election coming up next year. There's an election for your senators. There's an election so people need to hear what we expect as a community for our students and what we expect as voters. And if, in fact, they're not going to come out, I'd like to invite Governor Baker to come to the Brockton community and to look at what we're doing and to look at our challenges, to be very open about the support that we need from the state. Because the last thing we needed were additional charter seats in this, and I'm just using that as one of the points when you talk about how you can advocate. So the, the voting, if you're not registered to vote, register to vote. Doesn't take much. I believe you just have to have you know, your address. Um, I'm not sure really what proof that they looked, look for, but you have license, but you go to the registrar of voters. They usually have a time that you can register. And if you're not registered to vote, make sure you are, because that's the power of your voice. Um, and I think this will be the last question. Okay, I'll finish with the two questions. Okay. Um, um, sorry, we'll get to the third. There's no voice for you guys, and there's no voice for me with the kindergarten cutoff date. And so we, it's here now, but 
how do we move forward now that the charter school is here? We're not going to get those funding dollars. That's another conversation, like you said, mm -hmm. for another meeting. But since you were talking about it, it's just kind of like, OK, we have to just move on and find the funds. And like with the Brockton Kid ca Kids Count, what an awesome campaign. And so I used to work at the Chestnut Hill School. And I used to work in their development office. And it's a private school. The parents pay. And we have campaigns dedicated to goals. And so when I'm hearing about the funds that went into you know, the picture, or maybe not the picture, but the things to promote that campaign, it's almost like, could we have used it towards the old buildings? Could we have used it towards the goals that need to be worked on instead of what everybody else thinks? So what you see going down the roads, we can show people in our buildings being you know, transform. We can show people with the computers that are going into the classrooms to show that the kids count. So that's all I have to say on that. Um, but my question was going to be around homeschooling in Brockton. What um, is the connection to the public schools if this is something parents decide to do? Because I'm beginning to hear just from friends or people around me that they're deciding to homeschool. Mm -hmm. And I know one family does use an online version of the public school for homeschooling. So I guess, could you talk a little bit about I can I can talk that? a little bit about homeschooling. So homeschooling is approved by our school committee. You need to come forward as a parent. Uh, let us know that you're homeschooling your child. I believe we give you materials if you need materials. We'll offer support. We make sure that the child is progressing. And every year, it is approved. I don't know what the number is off the top of my head. Um, a percentage-wise, it's very low. But we have people that choose because of religious reasons, because of many reasons they don't want their children in a public school setting or a private school setting. Yeah. So they will choose to homeschool their children. Um, your next question was, I think, about virtual schools. So virtual schools are similar to school choice. It's similar to a charter school where a parent chooses. And there are a number of them out there that are approved by the Department of Education that probably are diploma carrying. I don't know much more about it other than, again, it's a very small percentage, but we do have some students in the district whose parents choose to do a virtual online school. Um, you know, to me, the most important thing about the school is socialization, meeting other children, taking part in activities. So I, again, every parent has to make their own decision. But when that's something that's provided through the online Brockton public schools? We do not have an online Brockton public schools. Okay. So there are, similar to you choosing a charter, a, oh, okay. par a parochial education, you can choose an online uh, education. Uh, there are a couple of providers. You would go to the website of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education because they're not housed anywhere. It's not like I can say it's down the street. But they will tell you what the approved uh, virtual schools are. Okay. And then for the preschoolers, should we be registering for the September preschoolers? Right, right now what they're doing is trying to finish up the kindergarten. Okay. They're meeting with a task force. Those parents that have right now the November and December babies will be contacted. Okay. And we'll talk about what that opportunity looks like. These, well, you always have, um, you like heard, the right. the diversity task force, and I'm wondering, can we be a part of it? Because I can get involved at the school, but when it comes to the, I guess, policies that affect all of the schools, where do we get to? The policies are in the hands of the school committee. Actually, now I know who didn't call me that. <laughs> so, I'm sure he was busy. He'll get back to you. School committee meetings are the first and third Tuesday of the month. So those are your school committee meetings. You're able to sign up for what we call hearing of visitors. If you usually have three minutes to share your concern, we don't interact at the school committee meeting, but your school committee member will hear what your concern is, and most of the time they'll follow up with you. But it does give you an opportunity publicly to share a concern that you have. Okay, thank you so much yep. for your time. Okay. Jenny? Um, so, um, at the Barrett Russell School, and you said that was for special needs 
Yes. Mm -hmm. The cafeteria and the gym is, yes. I was just wondering how that, that could be good for the students. Well, the cafeteria uh, isn't used as a regular cafeteria. If the children have little snacks, they're not there for necessarily a full day program. Very few classes are. It's a half day program, so it isn't used like the cafeteria would be used here. So they use it. There's a stage there, I believe. They have a section set off for their. Um, adaptive phys ed classes that they do with their little children that have IEPs and need the required services. Okay, and then the other thing about um, Governor Baker, um, wasn't it our own legislator back in February that uh, introduced the bill that would have their own pay raise? You know what, I can't say that I know what the answer is to that, so the question is, the, are you talking the pay raise for, who was they the pay raise? Pay who had the pay hike? Uh, she was here earlier. She vetoed the bill that Governor Baker said, I don't want any part of this to get to have more money. They want more money. They're the ones who took the money. So how can we go to this legislator who just take the money from our kids? That's what well, I want to know. Well, that's one way of you're looking at it. Um, they I also it's, up. It's in the well, well, it might be in the enterprise, but quite honestly, you know, people spend a lot of time at their job. You want to have people that are able to do the job and can earn a living wage. I don't know exactly. I don't, I don't know exactly. Well, that's, that's an issue you have with your legislature. then that's something that you'll have to address. Okay, there was one last question, and I said I would close with that. I didn't have a question. My name is Katie Pomona. I'm a parent of a 10th grader of Rockin' High, and I'm also an early educator. I actually am a super director of the child care center, so the kids are going to cut off after you guys expect us in some way. We usually have between 25 to 34 kids who go to kindergarten from our program. So many parents come to me and ask certain questions with the cutoff, I gave them letters. The preschool in Rocky Mountain, is that going to be there at Russell? No, right now we're looking for that space, so I can't announce that at this time. We're working with. The right. Well, we'll we will have we will have a space for it. At this point, I can't publicly say that. It'll be a.m. and p.m. It'll be an a.m. and p.m. session. And you're working with it now. What's the other working day? Where I don't know exactly. We have a task force uh, that's been going on actually for two or three years that involves a number of our community partners. Uh, we're talking again because we know it is going to affect. Head Start, I just picked out Brockton Day Nursery. Yeah. Work for the Y, so it's going to be yeah. the best too. So we need parents to come up for the morning care, afternoon care. Are you going to buy busing from these centers too to these day care centers? Or you uh, again, all of that is in discussion right so now. You're still working, you're still doing something mm -hmm. again right now. Um, we We're committed to providing <laughs> services to those youngsters that would have missed out. It gives us a chance. We haven't had, the preschool that we have is a special education yeah. preschool, which yeah. we're mandated by law from the child uh, being three years of age that requires special education services. We do have a voluntary, um, what we call typically developing peers in some of those classes. So that's the only preschool right now that we have in the district. So by looking at our youngsters that would have been part of our kindergarten population but have missed out because of the age cutoff, we are looking to have, uh, as you said, two half days, an AM and a PM session, probably a little less than 100 students each session and we're targeting those students that would have been part of our kindergarten population and this year. One last question. I have parents ask me already for a registration date. They're not on the website. Really? Our I, I looked at the day before I left um, work. I had two parents ask me when they start, and they're not okay. on the website. But you know what? I was just going to... Begins on March 22nd for kindergarten? I just saw it up on the billboard somewhere. Yeah. We'll make sure it's up on the website tomorrow. I'm surprised it's not up there. 
Yeah, it's not on the website yet. It's, it's, okay. We have some dates near the year. There are letters up there, but it's, we have the letters, but they don't have no right. something in there yet. Well, we need to correct that because if you up by Brockton High and you look at the big billboard, that's exactly <laughs> where they are. So it should be so up on our website. Sure that my parents are responsible. Yeah, very good. Thank, thank you. you. And I thank all of you this evening for coming and for having a voice. Um, and we look forward to our next uh, event, which is the 24th. If you're able to provide that time, come up to Brockton High School for our parents' forum taking place that evening from 6 to 7.30. But thank you very much for your time this evening.